Are you ready for an hour long session on slam poetry and interpretive <laughs> Bring it, brother. <laughs> okay, we're actually going to talk about performance and response to web design. I love that frame animation. <laughs> oh, so I posted this. Then I went online and bought a, bought a five dollar hat. Did somebody get a picture of me real quick? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like serious. Oh, no. oh you're right. <laughs> so I posted it on Twitter. American oh, yeah. flag. Wait, it's not even flag. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just pretend like I wore that the whole time? Um, oh yeah, so uh, my name is Zach. Yeah, not I work for uh, Filament Group, and Filament Group is a, is a design and uh, web development consultancy. And we have an ambitious goal. Our goal is to make the web that works for everyone. And you'll kind of see some of that in that in the presentation today. Um, so today we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to go through a little bit about what responsive web design is. Um, we're going to go over the difference between responsive web design and adaptive web design. A lot of people associate, oh, they have media queries on their site, so it's responsive design. No, that's not true. I'll go through some of that. Um, different assets that we can load on our web pages and how to make them load uh, more optimally. Common buzz skills and tips for faster loading pages, and I'll go through a few pages that do it bad and do it well. Um, so, to start us off, um, Responsive Web Design was actually invented on Alista Park, which is a web design blog, and it was um, just a blog post that Ethan Markoff wrote in 2010. So it's five years old, I guess, almost. It's kind of amazing, and it kind of evolved into a book that he wrote called Responsive Web Design, which the second edition just came out, if you're interested in that. <coughs> and it has a very simple definition. Three things. A flexible grid. So you have fluid percentages under width and fixed widths. Um, you have flexible media, so your images scale with your viewport or your layout. Um, images and video. And it's, as I kind of alluded to earlier, it's not just media queries. Yes, you need media queries to achieve a responsive web design, but it's, it's not just media queries. So a lot of times you'll hear People say, hey, let's, we have this design, let's add an iPhone breakpoint, or let's add an iPad breakpoint. And that is not what re responsive web design is. Responsive web design, um, or that's the definition of adaptive web design. It's just fixed breakpoints that exist on a page. Responsive web design is sort of the minutia in between your breakpoints, the fluidity of your media or your layouts between the breakpoints that you have on your page. And so this adaptive uh, approach, we call it twerky web design, um, because when you sort of resize your page, the images on it will jump around. So this is Apple.com, I just took it last night. And you can see when the page goes small, it jumps. There's no fluidness when the, when the, um, the viewport is being resized. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Right. So that's twerky. We call it twerky. Um, and this is bad, right, because you need to support the huge number of different viewports that exist on devices today. So this is just current Android devices that exist in the marketplace. This is the different viewport sizes for those. So you can kind of see why a twerky web design or an adaptive web design might not fulfill the needs of um, all of these different devices that exist. So this is a screenshot of the very first website that ever existed on the web. Um, it was made by CERN, just like the, you go into web history, this page still exists. Um, and it's kind of responsive, right, because if you resize the page, the text flows nicely. Um, it doesn't, there aren't breakpoints at which things jump around, it just kind of reflows very nicely. And so Jordan Moore wrote this blog post a while back, and he said the web was always responsive. We just sort of added these constraints on top of it that sort of limited our designs. And that's 
kind of true, but it's not really true if you use the, the exact definition of responsive web design. You need those three things that we outlined earlier. So I would say that the web has responsive roots. So what do you do if you don't want to do a responsive web design on your, on your page? You can do nothing, which is to say you can ignore mobile. And if you guys remember the Steve Jobs keynote um, that came out when he very first introduced the first iPhone, he held up the Safari web browser on the iPhone, and it showed a screenshot of the New York Times website. And this is kind of an example of what the New York Times did for a very long time. They sort of ignored the special constraints of the small screen um, and just relied on users zooming in and out and sort of scrolling around on the page. Which, um, I mean, in the beginning, Steve Jobs thought that was a good alternative, but really that isn't as usable as we can make our pages. Or the other alternative is that you can use a separate uh, M.site. site. An M dot site is sort of like a, a, another subdomain or subdirectory that you set up on your page to, to develop a site that's specifically for mobile. So when we think about ignoring mobile, uh, Luke Rablowski has this, had this quote on Twitter. He said. Uh, mobile internet adoption has outpaced desktop internet adoption by eight times. When I first included this quote in the presentation, it was certainly um, less obvious at the time, because this was <coughs> probably created this slide a couple of years ago. Um, but mobile is just exploding right now, right? People are starting to do, uh, have mobile devices be their only device that they have. They don't have a desktop. Um, and this slide is quite a bit updated, so you can see that this trend of people sort of ditching the, the heavier desktop and uh, laptop computers and moving towards just mobile. Mobile traffic is definitely increasing. So the other alternative that we kind of talked about was separate M dot sites. Um, so usually when you have a separate M dot site, you go to a page with a mobile browser, they will redirect to the mobile subdomain or the mobile subdomain. <coughs> and the one thing you should know about performance is that full page redirects are slow. Um, so if you have that sort of server side uh, framework that tries to guess what device it is based on the user agent and redirect to a completely different website based on that user agent, it's going to be slower than if you had just presented them code up front as soon as possible. And also, we have to worry about ma maintaining those UA uh, user agent parsing server side libraries. So, a popular one is Wordful, um, and I make fun of that a lot on Twitter. Um, but it's still a very popular thing, right? People use these things to create um, separate M dot sites. And the third consideration I would, I would ask you to think about is content strategy. So, a lot of times when we have these separate mobile sites, we'll have uh, view desktop site link at the bottom. Um, and we need to worry about having the, the content that the user wants to see on mobile and on desktop. And they have completely separate considerations. That's what the M.site site people will try to convince you. Um, I completely explained this way too much already. Right? Um, so with redirects, when I'm talking about redirects that are slow, um, the Yahoo Developer Network has this quote basically the same thing I just said. It just slows down the user experience. You're insert, inserting another uh, pause in between when the, when the browser starts interpreting code and showing things to the users, rendering pages, um, just introduces another delay. And Wordful, which is the user agent parsing library that I talked about a little bit earlier, it only updates about once a month. So every time a new device comes out, they need to update that library. You need to update <coughs> All right. Okay. We'll roll with it. Okay. So, Wordful updates. A new device comes out. You need to update every site that you have that uses Wordful. So, do we want to go back and maintain all of these different server side uh, implementations that we have with all these new devices? Um, I would say no. You can just as easily achieve uh, a responsive web design that serves all these different devices without having a separate. 
So Brad Frost had a great, great quote. He said, get to a point with your web strategy, you don't crap your pants every time Brad Frost is out, right? <laughs> <laughs> but all these people are like, oh yeah, we need to redeploy our website, we need to work overtime um, to get the new, uh, you know, adaptive or mobile site working for this new user agent that Apple has come out with. And so when you talk about content strategy, this is the desktop and mobile links. This is an example um, on Wikipedia. So this is the mobile site. If you go to Wikipedia, they have a completely separate mobile page. And then at the bottom, if you have a desktop browser, if they somehow have made an error and redirected you to the incorrect page, you can click through to the desktop site. And the strange part about this is that it has completely separate content, right? So if I want to look something up on Wikipedia, all of a sudden they've changed <laughs> what shows on the home page. They've reduced the amount of information that is available to me because they think I'm on a mobile browser. And I would argue that that is a very bad thing to do. So here's an example of your own desktop site, and they have another link back to the mobile view. And so Matt Markey had a great, great, great quote. He said, mobile users want to see our menu, talking about restaurants, hours, and delivery number. Desktop users <laughs> definitely want to see this giant picture of someone staring at a salad. <laughs> 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 Ten points we can spot the topless guy. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the different kind of assets that we can load on our page and our responsive web design to make them load faster and better and render quickly, more quickly to our users. So the first type of asset that I want to go through today is CSS. Um, so the problems with CSS. When you include a CSS style sheet on your page, um, browsers will download and block rendering while it's, while it's downloading that external style sheet. Um, browsers will sometimes download unnecessary background images that you have embedded in your CSS. Um, big giant images are often wasted on small screens, and when you have a high uh, definition display, a retina image um, you want that retina image, but if you don't have a high definition display, oftentimes people will serve the retina image to a, to, a, to a lower quality display and it will waste their bandwidth and fix it. So when we're talking about the average web page, um, and this graph got so much worse than the last time I made it, it's kind of interesting. Images uh, on the slide that were originally on here only took about 800k, and now they're up to over uh, 1.2, about 1.2 meg. Um, so it's kind of crazy how big our, the average site is getting. It's almost up to 2 megabyte, um, which is just ridiculous, especially if you're on 3G. I don't know if you guys are on Sprint. Is anybody on Sprint? Sprint is bad. Or <laughs> um, so it makes you appreciate web performance a little bit more. Um, so, when we're talking about CSS, there's also JavaScript. JavaScript will also block rendering on your page. So when the browser encounters an external JavaScript file, it will stop progressive rendering while the file is downloaded, parsed, and executed. Um, again, that's a huge delay. <coughs> so here's some JavaScript that doesn't block the progressive rendering. If you put your script source at the bottom um, near the end of the body tag, um, your page will have already progressively rendered. Um, the, the page will be visible to the user, and then it will, um, I mean, it will still block rendering, but there'll be nothing left to render. Here's another example of a few um, JavaScript external uh, references that won't block. If you use the async attribute, um, your script source will download right away, but it won't, it won't block, it won't execute until rendering. <coughs> And if you want to wait to download until the, the page is rendered, you can just add the deferred attribute. Or you can also create your script node dynamically using DOM. Um, so here's an example of that. You just create the script node, the script element, and then um, insert it onto your page using JavaScript. So going back to style sheets. Um, Browsers will block rendering, as we said, until the screen CSS arrives. So on a style sheet, you can actually include a media attribute that kind of tells the browser what type of style sheet you're going to. You might recognize this from 
print style sheets, you can have a specific style sheet for a print. <clears throat> um, but browsers will download all of those style sheets even if they don't apply to the current page. So for example, if you use print, TV, if you had a device ratio, um, media attribute, um, it will, browsers will still download those. That's not desirable behavior, even if, even if uh, the media attribute doesn't, doesn't apply to your current page. So let's see, we're going to have to demo here. So you can see this page is already loaded. It's executing this thing that's changing the title here. So you can see that it's, it's updating the title here, but nothing is rendering on the page. No, how do I get out of it? <laughs> <laughs> And so once the style sheets have all successfully loaded, it will actually show the page content. So you can see in this test here, it's DOM content loaded. That's basically this, if you had a page with nothing but HTML on it, the DOM content loaded event happens when it encounters the end of the body tag. Everything is loaded successfully on the page. But on load, when all the style sheets have successfully loaded, is a full 10 seconds later, 11 seconds later. So not good. We we'll get the source code for this. It's not very helpful. So. <coughs> so browsers have tried to get a little bit smarter about this media behavior. Um, so, for example, in the blank rendering engine, which is used by Chrome, um, if it encounters this. On just a normal style sheet on the page, it does the same thing as it would normally as every other browser. But if it encounters a media attribute um, that has a, a media query inside of it that doesn't apply to the current page, so for example, this second, we oh, got a laser on here. What is that? Um, so the second one here has a min width of 4,000 pixels. Now, unless you have one of those 34 inch widescreen monitors that are super cool that I want to get, you're probably going to have a 4,000 pixel min, uh, min width um, viewport. So this should not apply to the page. So Blink actually makes, it still downloads it, but it makes it a low priority. So it'll go through all your, even though these, may, these regular style sheets might not be in the same execution order, it will download all of, all of the regular style sheets, and then it will circle back and download the low priority ones. And so it also does this for uh, print style sheets as well. But everything else but Blink still does it the crappy way. Downloads sequentially, blocks, blocks, blocks. I'll show an example of this. So my coworker Scott Gell made this uh, example of this test page to show all of the media queries that you can put inside of a media attribute to see what browsers will download what. And almost every single browser downloaded everything. Now, given blank downloads some of these at a lower priority, but it still downloads. So here's Firefox 35, every single style sheet downloaded sequentially. Safari, same thing. Um, but you can see uh, Chrome and Opera, which both use Blink, um, it went through the three main style sheets, downloaded those, and then did the lower priority ones later. So there were all these media queries that didn't apply to the page. So mid width, 4,000 pixels, and media type TV. Yeah, a bunch of stuff that just didn't like. So what can we do to fix these problems with CSS? First thing is we have to recognize that CSS is kind of safer, right? It controls all of our presentation on our page. So we need to minimize as, as much, get rid of unnecessary CSS when possible. Um, we could make separate link elements for each breakpoint. It doesn't really scale and it doesn't really work uh, in anything but blank. Sorry, that should say blank, not what it did. Um, so it's not really a great solution that works across browser. So one of the things that we've kind of, or the community has kind of started to adopt is that we try and separate and inline our critical CSS. So critical CSS um, is something I'll go into a little bit more. Uh, 
I mean slides, but the thing you have to realize about websites, and this is a, a sort of a recommendation that Google has put out, is that when it comes to networking protocols, the first 14 kilobytes that are interpreted by the page are really the most important. So if you have an HTML page that has 14 kilobytes of meta tags and like SEO crap at the top, and then it has style sheets and JavaScript after that, um, the first Putting your code as high up in that first 14 kilobytes as possible is better for the performance of your page. So that's what we're trying to do with critical CSS. We're trying to inject some of our CSS in line on the page at the top in a style block so that it's included in that first 14 kilobyte. And that will make the page seem to render almost instantaneous. So we have this tool um, from Filament Group that will actually go out to your page you can, here's a, just a sample grunt config for it. It will hit this URL. I have this one on a local list, but you can use whatever uh, URL that you want there. It will parse out, send a viewport of 1200 by 900, and you can configure that. And it will parse out every style that applies to that viewport. So anything below the 1200 by 900 fold, as it were, does not get included. So we'll create a completely separate style sheet with just those rules that apply to the uh, top 1200 by 900 uh, viewport. So here's kind of an example of what it looks like on uh, our website, filmmakergroup.com. So on the left is the fully styled page. On the right is the page with just the critical styles applied. So everything sort of below that 1200 by 900 fold uh, doesn't look styled. Everything above that looks great. So we inject the critical styles in line in a style block on the page. Here's an example of that. We, we just sort of, we just dump those styles right on the page in the markup. And then we use this utility called load CSS, which is something we developed to asynchronously load a style sheet without blocking. Um, and then we just load the rest of our styles and just sort of throw them on the page after. So yeah, there's some overlap there between the complete sheet and the critical, um, but the rules are just applied um, on top of those, and so it, it doesn't really matter. And also, we want that complete sheet URL to be cached, um, so we can request it later. So that makes sense. Does it cache it for you, or is that something else you set up? No, it will. So, so yeah, it will. It will insert the complete sheet at CSS into the cache. And so what, just a, a little more complicated, so the way we use it in production is that we'll set a cookie after the initial page view. So when you go to the page and you don't have any, um, anything in cache, nothing, it's just a completely from scratch page view, um, this is how we do it. And then we set a cookie on the page, um, and, when the page and when the user does a repeat view, we just do the normal blocking style sheet, just the normal <coughs> link tag requesting this complete sheet.css. And because we know more or less that that URL is already in cache, it will appear as if um, it's instantaneous, very similar to our critical CSS. Um, and the load CSS utility is also on GitHub. You can check that out. Um, we have examples of that online as well. Um, and if you want to learn more about this, Scott Hill wrote a great blog post called How We Make Our WD sites load fast as heck. Um, and it's kind of funny, we have a Twitter alert every time someone mentions this article on, the, on uh, Twitter in our chat room. It's, just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how many people are tweeting. I just, I've never seen anything. I don't know, spam box got it or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we went over CSS, we went over a little bit about JavaScript. Um, let's talk about responsive images now. So when an image request is made, it doesn't block anything on the page. Um, so it isn't as obtrusive to performance as your CSS or your JavaScript. Um, but that doesn't mean you get a free pass, right? Because it's, it clogs up your, your request pipeline. You only have so much bandwidth um, to download a page. And so images are, as you can see, the, the biggest chunk of the average web page. So we need to really concentrate on, on methods that we can use to decrease that. Um, so a lot of people will conflate responsive images and background images together. And 
I really want to convey to you that they're different things. So CSS background images are just you know images that you embed inside your style sheets and you reference them using the background image property. Um, when you talk about responsive images, those are content images, images that are shown in our markup. Um, so they're they're just very they're very different things. The CSS background images um, is kind of a solved problem when it comes to responsive designs. Um, but the responsive images is more kind of a work in, part, in progress. So I have a bunch of examples um, in this um, presentation that kind of go through different mechanisms for including images on your page and how to kind of make them not do uh, duplicate requests. So for example, when you hide an image in CSS, so we have a content image here in our markup, and we have CSS that just takes that ID and runs <coughs> it, um, that image is still requested even though it's hidden. So just display none things on your page doesn't mean that they won't be requested and log up your request pipeline just like everything else. So don't do this to not request an image on your page. Um, yeah, but, um, so in that same vein, when you have a CSS background image hidden in CSS, um, it sometimes will make that request as well. So for example, we have this test to div here. Um, we set a background image here, and then we display it on it. That is still requested in a bunch of these different routers. Um, so that's really not a foolproof way of um, sort of overloading the image to make it not be displayed. So don't do that. But if you have a image set, background image set on a child div, and then hide the parent div, that actually works pretty good. So we yeah, have some black magic here. <laughs> Um, so, if you replace the URL, the background image URL, uh, with a new background image, that's actually pretty good too. That's no problem with that. If you're trying to replace an image at a smaller resolution, it's a pretty safe thing to do. Kind of okay. um, this is actually probably a more common one. So we have our retina style sheet that we're a retina block media query that we're, we have here, and we want to replace a uh, background image with a higher resolution one. And that's an that's an okay thing too. Like I mentioned, CSS background images for the most part um, are kind of a solved problem because we have the mechanisms to uh, sort of make these make these uh, approaches work. So yeah, in this example, we're just having a higher res uh, image for a for a retina screen. <clears throat> and so also, there's a there's a more official way to do this this problem. So in CSS background images, there's something called image set. Um, it's not very well supported across browser, but it will do a very similar thing. Um, you can say, here's my image set. Here's an asset I want to load here at 1x, and if a screen is 2x, so a high definition screen, more than uh, two pixels per CSS pixel, um, then we want to use this high resolution image. And it will do something very similar to that previous stuff, or the, this previous one that I talked about. But the browser support isn't really all that great. It doesn't work in Firefox, it doesn't work in IE. So if you have to use a higher resolution background image, stick with the media query method for now. So, we talked about CSS background images, let's talk about content images, which is our responsive images. So all the things we really talked about so far haven't been about responsive images. This is responsive images. Um, so first thing we're, we're talking about content images on our page. I mean, you can use a vector image and go that route. You can use an SVG in your page. You can embed embed bitmaps inside of SVG so they don't get fooled by like a pseudo SVG. If it's an actual vector asset, go ahead and use that because it's going to be uh, automatically retina friendly. It'll automatically scale to um, the high high definition screens. Um, most content images are not going to be SVG, 
Um, so really when we're talking about responsive images, we're really talking about PNGs, JPEGs, and GIFs. And WebPs, but let's be honest, nobody gives a WebP. <laughs> um, so yeah, the easiest thing to do when you want to implement responsive images on your page is just to use the source set uh, attribute. So we have a content image here. We have our small default uh, J JPEG. And then we have our high definition one that we have for retina screens. And then just the normal one here. So when the browser interprets this, it will automatically do the math for you behind the scenes to request the correct image uh, based on the screen's device picture ratio. So for most use cases, this is going to work fine for you. If you want to get a little bit more complicated with it, there's a different, so you notice how this is just very simple 1x, 2x modifiers. You can actually also use the W modifier, which is just the content size of your image. So, so for example, this large JPEG is uh, 10, 10, 24 pixels wide. So if I open it up in preview and look at the image size, it'll be 10, 24 by whatever height. Uh, medium is 640 pixels wide, and small is 320 pixels wide. Um, and if we use the sizes attribute with that W modifier, it will actually apply our retina images for us automatically. So sizes is a little bit more complicated. It's a guess, it's kind of a, a rough estimate that you're giving the browser to tell it what viewport width, so for example, 100 viewport VW units is the entire width of your viewport. So when I say an image in my layout, is going to be 100 viewport units, that means it takes up the entire width of the viewport. If in my layout it only takes up one third of the uh, viewport at, say, for example, 36 uh, M's and above, um, I don't remember what that, what's 36 times 16 to get in pixels, but um, it will be roughly one third of the, of the viewport. So the browser will interpret this sort of this rough estimate that you're giving it for the layout size, because when it rent, when it parses this markup, it doesn't know anything about the CSS yet. It needs to know. So browsers have a pre-parser. You guys are familiar with the pre-parser. So actually go out and and try and fetch external resources before it actually renders anything on the page. Before it actually starts parsing any of your nodes, and it will actually do this with images. So when the pre-parser encounters this code, it doesn't have any knowledge of CSS layout. It doesn't know um, sort of how the image is going to look on your page. So that's why we need to sort of tell it with the sizes um, attribute. And this is automatically retina friendly. So it will do the math for you. If you have, if it, if it knows it's only a third of the viewport and it knows the viewport is 600 pixels, then it will apply this medium JPEG, even though if you're on a high definition screen, even though the small JPEG would work, the medium JPEG is going to fit the retina screen a little bit better. So I know that's complicated. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll give you more resources to read up on that because it, uh, it is a little bit hard to, to understand. And they don't have as many pictures as I should on here. But, um, so yeah, in that vein. Um, so if you, for most use cases, you can just get away with using source set in your markup. You don't have to worry about this fancy picture element. Picture element is really only needed when you want to do art direction on your page. So art direction is if you want a different cropping on your image at different resolutions. So I can't make an example of that. Yeah. So. If you want this, I don't remember what the White House dog's name is, but if you want the White House dog to be super zoomed in when you're on a small viewport, and you want it to be super zoomed out when you're on a desktop screen, then you, that's that's the use case in which you want to use picture. If you're not doing that with your images, just stick with source set and that'll work fine. Now, of course, the browse support for those two things are not great. So there's a polyfill that exists for both source set and picture, called picture fill. Um, and it will allow you to use those things on your pages today. So here's just a couple of examples of the, uh, the markup that comes with picture, picture element. 
And you can use source set inside of picture as well, but it's really just a bunch of different individual source elements um, depicting <coughs> these uh, image references, and then you just put a media query on here as well. So I won't spend too much time on this because really, you're, most of the time, you're just going to be using source set to do stuff like this. So, and I'll put this uh, slideshow online so you guys can go back and review this. Um, but yeah, like I said, you can reuse source set here. You can use the X modifiers to do uh, high definition images. So now we're going to talk about compressive images. So forget everything I just said about picture and source set. Um, <laughs> those two things are really, you want to use them sparingly, I would say, on your pages for now. Um, so when you have a very prominent uh, image on your page, maybe like at the top you have like a banner image um, that's very large and takes up a lot of uh, bandwidth, it's very large in size, um, that's where you'd want to use picture and source set. <coughs> For a lot of things you can get away with this approach we call compressive images. So if your image is a JPEG, you open it up in your image editor and when you save it, this problem will look familiar to you because I have a weird image editor Pixelnator, but um, when you save a JPEG, most image editors will have a quality. Uh, what's this thing called? Quality. Somebody help me. Slider. Slider. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So yeah, you just you you dump the quality down to very low, um, and then we'll keep the original resolution at what it was at, dump the quality very low, and then we'll just sort of client side resize the image down. So for example, we have this 800 by 600 image. And this is what will look client side. So if we dump the, the quality down to very, very minimal, and then just resize it in CSS to be sort of half of what it was originally, or double in the original. I don't know. You guys figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I explain it very good. But so, so this is the original uh, size of the image that you save it at, and this is what size that you want to display it in the browser. So the actual image size is double the dimensions. You're just resizing on the client side with CSS. So it's supposed to look better. Right. It will look better, and it will be smaller. So. It's actually kind of strange, and it shouldn't work this way, but um, it will give you a smaller file size than if you had just scaled it down 400 by 300 in your image editor itself with the higher quality, um, and it will look better on high definition screens. So it's it's kind of a crazy thing, but it, the the trade back here or the trade off here is that um, it will take more memory. So if you have a ton of compressive images on your page and you have a really old device that you're trying to interpret that on. Um, it takes more work on the client side to resize those images down. Um, but for most use cases, you will really not have to worry about that. You guys want to talk about fonts? <laughs> you? Well, I've, been, well, I've been doing a lot of talks about fonts uh, recently. So the problem with using font paste on your page, a lot of sites have this problem is that when, when, it, when the browser interprets the font base and it knows you're going to use that in, in content on your page, it will hide all the elements on the page that are using that font. So we can kind of see this in my test example. I used a nice warm ipsum from a recruiter email that I got. <laughs> um, so the page is loading, and it makes all the content using the font base um, text invisible while the page loads. When the font loads successfully, then it pops in and repaints the, using the new font. We call this the flash of invisible text, or the John Foyt. <laughs> yes, somebody got that. <laughs> uh, so this is what Facebook looks like today. Uh, I brought it up in web page test that work, which gives you a nice little sort of film strip view of how a page loads over time. So you can see at 1.1 seconds <coughs> at the top is when the initial render happened for Facebook.com. But it's missing some things, right? Um, and then after 200 milliseconds, the fonts load, and it uh, will show that text that's using our remote font face. 
And here is Apple.com on a mobile device. And this is a separate m.set, I believe. I'm not sure. Um, and they, and this is on the imp, uh, and what VHS will actually let you simulate different network connections. So I'm, for this example, I'm using a 3G connection. Um, so at eight seconds is when Apple.com starts to render on a 3G connection. It's not great. Um, and then five seconds later, on a 3G connection, the primary content image loads. This is not fonts. There's no fonts visible yet. I mean, this this text down here is an image. That's not that's not text that you can like select and read. Well, I mean, you can read it. But a screen reader can read it. Um, and then another what is this? It goes from eight to thirteen, and then another three seconds after that, the font loads. So the, your content is like the very last thing that loads on your page. It's like the worst progressive rendering of a site of all time. <laughs> because all the images came back, everything came back, and then finally the next. It's crazy. Um, so one of the things that we do at Filament Group to kind of work around this is that we'll use that same sort of load CSS utility that I talked about earlier to load a completely separate style sheet that has our data URI encoded fonts embedded directly in the style sheet. So for example, this is, um, we have a separate style sheet for the WAF format. We'll put all our WAF format files in a, in a single style sheet, and we'll use that load CSS utility to load this asynchronously. And the reason this works is because when the browser interprets the font family, that's when it starts to hide the text. So it, we put the font family and the, the actual font content in the same file. The browser receives them at the same time, has no chance for which to, um, normally it has no chance for which to flash that visible text to, to the user. So yeah, we just load, <clears throat> use load CSS to load that font style sheet separately. Another, uh, another approach you can do to work around this problem is to use the CSS font loading API, um, which is a JavaScript API to tell you when a font face lo has loaded successfully. So in this example, we're using the railway font from Google Fonts. Um, we just include the style sheet as we normally would in our CSS for the font face block. It will reference those external files. Um, and our CSS font loading API will tell us when this railway font is loaded. And then we'll add a class to the document. So it's a CSS class. We'll add that to the document. And it will that will repaint um, everything that we're using here. So by default, it just uses, the page just uses our normal sans serif font. And then when this class is loaded, it will repaint and start using our web font. And the, again, the uh, browser support for CSS font loading API is not great right now. It's just in Chrome um, and Opera. So I wrote a polyfill to work with this. Um, and this will work in all browsers. So. <coughs> My definition of all rest is probably wider than yours, so. <laughs> um, yeah. Does anybody support BlackBerry 6? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So now I want to go through a few buzzkills, problems with responsive web design or just performance in general. Um, advertising is a huge buzzkill. Who has a site with like ads on it? No one. So advertising is really, really bad for performance. It's like full of just like crappy document write JavaScript that will block. Um, it's full of iframes. Um, it's just it's it's really bad. So you can have like a super great page that's just like oh it's just beautiful, and you'll put these ads on it. You really should. <laughs> so that's a super buzz skill. But one thing you can do is actually inject the advertising uh, advertising. Uh, using iframes with JavaScript after onload. So customers might not be on board with this, so you want to check to make sure that's okay. Um, but it's kind of a workaround that you can use to dynamically inject those advertisements after everything is already loaded on the page. Um, but a lot of customers want those ads like right up to that, which is awesome. Um, another bad thing is a lot of sites will put like these social networking widgets on the page, and they'll go like, oh, let's add a like button, let's add a tweet button. 
It's not a Google Plus One button. Everybody uses Google Plus, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the only, the only reason people are putting Google Plus buttons on their sites is because it weighs in with Google's SEO shit. Which is just like, oh, it's so bad. Because it's, these, just these three buttons are over 400K. <laughs> wow, what? Ridiculous. It's horrible. So, well, I have this little utility, our film group has this little utility that we wrote. That's, it's called Social Count. Basically what it do, does, it, it delays the loading of the social button until you interact with the widget. So, for example, if I hover over the slide, that's when it will initiate the, the request to Facebook. So it doesn't, it doesn't save you that wait. It just sort of delays it until the user tries to interact with that. Um, and I don't know if I'd even recommend using this anymore. I would, because this, I mean, it's just so bad that you, they actually have just normal share links that you can use that will just redirect to their pages directly. Um, it won't give you the inline Facebook like, so the users won't be able to just like stuff on your page without leaving it. But I mean, there's so many like there's so much evidence that people don't actually use this stuff anyway. But if you want to use it, use this. But I would recommend just using those full page links to the directly to the shared URLs. And there's a there's ways to do that on the uh, social account repo. It's Film and Group. You just go to Film and Group on GitHub and search for social accounts on it. So, dang. <laughs> All right, how are we doing on time? We're still good? Yeah. I want to go through a couple of uh, existing responsive designs. Just sort of gossip about them, I guess. Um, so all of these I went through and tested using webpagetest.org. That, that tool is amazing. If you're not using that, definitely, if you take away one thing today, take away webpagetest.org. This is the, it's the most amazing tool for checking out the performance of your site. The film strip view is unbelievable for seeing where your performance bottlenecks are, just from a high level. And if you show that to your boss or show that to your um, stakeholders, then um, it's really easy to convince them of, that your site has a performance problem if you just show them that film strip view. Um, and that's what I kind of showed with the Apple.com and Facebook.com stuff. So Boston Globe is, is one that Film and Group did a long, long time ago, before I even started there. Um, and I've been there for a couple of years now. So um, it was kind of one of the first big responsive <coughs> web design implementations. Uh, Boston Globe kind of took a chance on this responsive web design approach. They decided to redo their whole site using it. Um, so it was kind of one of the first um, uh, big responsive web designs. It was kind of cool. Um, it's one of the reasons actually I wanted to work at Coleman Group, because they're doing all this cool responsive stuff. Um, so we can kind of see the web page test result here. The big ones you want to worry about are start, start render, which is kind of how much time, or first byte is how much time it takes to get that first byte from the server. So if your server is slow, it'll show here. Start render is how much time it takes for the user to actually see something on the screen. Speed index is kind of a black magic number that, that really tries to tell you how much so lower is better when it comes to speed index. So it tries to tell you how much, how soon content is available to the user. So a low speed index will mean a lot of your page content is available much sooner. A high speed index means that your page took a lot of time to render. So if you have a bunch of text that shows at first render, that's good for your speed index. If you're using font face and that text doesn't load until one point or 16 seconds, wherever it was on Apple.com, that's going to hurt your speed index. So it's kind of a measure of how fast your site progressively renders. It's a really, really great number to take a look at. Um, and that's kind of it. I mean, you kind of want to worry about page weight as well. Um, and the other great thing about this is it will show you first view and then a cached view. Um, so it will give you two different approaches. So this is kind of the bar that we're working with here. A speed index of like 3,000 is not great, um, but again, they have a lot of advertising on this page. So like I mentioned, um, you, you spend all of your time working on this perfect thing, and you just set it free into the world, and then it does drugs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
So here's the function review. You can see that first render is at two seconds, which is not ideal. Um, and you can kind of see a 2.5 second, 3 seconds, 4.5 seconds. They pop in some giant thing, probably JavaScript injected, because it's kind of so late in the large one. So the best one that I've ever seen is Smashing Magazine. They have advertisements on their page with their speed index is 469. It's amazing. First byte is amazing. Start render is. <laughs> yep. Google Docs. Love you. That's not even my keyword. <laughs> All right. I don't have any. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's unbelievable. They did, a, uh, vividly did a great job on it. It's the tiniest page of all time, almost smaller than those three social widget buttons. Um, <laughs> 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 I can't even tell it without the so test. I mean, it's so fast. Yeah, right. I, I oh, yeah. Every day I'm going. It feels instantaneous, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's a great site. It's really kind of unbelievable. Um, they have their initial render at 0.5 seconds. And this is, it might even be sooner than that. You can set the interval to be smaller, um, but it kind of makes it harder to see. You can set it at 0.1 seconds. So um, if it, it, it could have happened any, anywhere between 0 seconds and, and 500 milliseconds. So their initial render is great. And really, it looks like an almost fully usable page, right? You can read the, read the content, um, and nothing really like, moves around. Like, it doesn't inject ads that sort of jank where you are on the page scroll. Um, doesn't move anything around. I don't know. It's, it's a great site. Starbucks is another one. Um, first bite's good. There's start renders. It's okay. Speed index good. Um, it's a pretty good site, I would say. Uh, Time Magazine is responsive. First bite could be better. Start render, not great. Two seconds. Speed index, it's about the same as what Boston Globe was. Um, Disney is bad, um, but to be fair, this was actually like a, when I took these screenshots, this was actually like a game. They had like a game on here, but uh, so not not a very progressive rendering, but dang, you get a game. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's not not a great speed index. Five thousand is pretty bad. So I think Paul Arch just said if you can get your speed index below one thousand, that's kind of an ideal. So here's film and group. Yeah, represent. <laughs> Ours is not actually as good as Smashing Magazine, which is a little depressing. <laughs> but our first buy is worse. So our server is worse than theirs. We need to put more money into our server, I guess. Um, so yeah, well ours, is, ours is still pretty good. But I think it has less content on it than Smashing Magazine does. Yeah, you can see our, our website is about a third of the size of those social widgets. <laughs> <laughs> um, but our film strip view looks a little, uh, looks better. It looks, I don't know, it's done at one second. And there's, I think, finished. I mean, there's initial, their initial render is better, which is kind of what you want. Um, but ours finished is worse. So. <laughs> <laughs> So if you want to see more examples of this, you can follow Responsive Web Design on Twitter. Um, they tweet out new responsive designs that they've seen. And if you have one that you've completed and you add message him, he'll like tweet it out to people. He's got like, I don't know, 50,000 followers or something like that. Um, it's a good way to get exposure for your uh, responsive design if you're working on it. So, getting towards the end. Uh, so yeah, so to kind of sum it up, um, the reason that I created this slideshow at the beginning is because when Responsive Web Design came out, a lot of people were kind of talking crap about it because they said, oh, responsive designs are slow. And no, I would say that pages are slow. Responsive design solves problems. Tools solve problems, and problem solving requires code. So we're pay yes, we're paying a penalty for solving those problems, but we can do so in a way um, that doesn't hurt our page's performance. So for example, there's a site called briefcakes.com. <laughs> <laughs> and their desktop site is 
31 megs, they had like a ton of cake images on it. But they're, they had a completely separate M.2 set that was 63 megs. Can you imagine downloading that thing? That's awesome. Um, so you can do mobile sites poorly, mobile separate sites poorly. You can do responsive sites poorly. You can't say one or the other is bad for performance. You can do both badly. So I would say if you mistakenly believe that responsive web design is too large for mobile, you should instead say that sites are too large. So the secret of this presentation is that really it, none of it had to do with responsive web design when I was talking about the code that we're implementing, right? Um, because really we want to focus on making all sites better. We can rising tide lifts all our boats, right? So if we can make sites better, it, it doesn't really matter. If they, I mean, I prefer to make sites using responsive web design. Um, but if you can't convince your boss to do that, you can still implement a lot of this stuff um, on sites that aren't using responsive web design. But really, please use responsive web design because it's just browsing on sites without it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and really, the fastest website is the one with nothing on it. So use the tools that we have to solve problems in your users. If you want to learn more about this presentation, I based it, this entire thing is me just parroting the things that I learned from Scott Jell working with him. And he's written a book called Responsible Responsive Design, which provides a lot more detail about implementing all of these individual things that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so, buy his book. <laughs> <laughs> the end. Any questions? Yeah. Could you uh, weigh in on the debate between bundling your JavaScript and CSS all into one file versus um, putting them into smaller files for downloads on mobile? Sure. So I would say that CSS and JavaScript are two different things, and you should treat them differently when you're having that discussion. So we've kind of mentioned that you want to, the first 14 kilobytes is the most critical and then for initial page render. So as we mentioned, as I mentioned, you take that critical CSS tool, find what CSS properties and selectors apply to that, and inline them on the page. Dump them right into your HTML. So the first 14 kilobyte that the browser downloads includes all of the styles that are required to render your page. So that makes your render, it progressively renders, the page progressively renders like so much faster because it doesn't have to go out and request an external resource. So with JavaScript, it's a little bit different. We um, we actually do something called cut the mustard, and that's kind of a little bit more complicated approach that I didn't really talk about today. Um, but we so we separate our JavaScript into it's kind of very similar to the critical CSS approach. So we have a very tiny like JavaScript, like almost like a bootloader that we have to do a, a lot of our feature tests that apply with our CSS, and um, so we actually segment. So as we have that tiny loader, and then we have the majority of our JavaScript that we keep in a completely separate file. So we have a we have just a, a baseline in, inference in our bootloader. So if the browser supports a very common one that we use, if the browser supports query selector in their document, then it has that query selector API. So IE8 plus, um, and basically every other browser um, it has query selector. So if a browser doesn't have that. We won't, we won't even request that giant JavaScript file. It, the page won't even see it. So to do that, you need to do progressive enhancement because your page needs to work without that giant JavaScript file. Um, but if you want to support legacy mobile browsers in a way that's super snappy and fast, um, I would recommend you check out Cut the Muster because um, that will help you sort of work around JavaScript problems performance problems on mobile devices, because a lot of mobile devices won't even see the bulk of our JavaScript that we have on our page. Do you recommend if you have, a let's say, a site that has, let's say, three different sections, and you only need this big library for section two, would you save the load of that JavaScript and not bundle it with the, would you make a critical bundle and then maybe a larger bundle for the sections of the site? Or would you instead just say, hey, let's just bundle them all together, and you get them one time, it's cached, and then you're, you're golden everywhere you go? Yeah. Do you have any guidelines on that? It's tough, right? Because 
when you make a request to the server, you have, you pay an upfront penalty for every request that you make. So there's a certain incentive to sort of bundling everything together. Um, so a lot of performance recommendations want you to bundle as much as possible. Um, and that goes into sort of some more complicated how <coughs> TCP IP works and you know, just a lot of stuff. So bundling is good. Um, I would say that it when it comes to the section two that you were talking about, it really depends on where that is on the page. If it's further down on the page, load it asynchronously. Um, sort of make it load at a lower priority. So you can create that script element in your DOM and inject it wherever you want on your page. I mean, you have full control of that. Um, so it's it's certainly a trade-off between both, but I would say you, you want to lean more towards bundling than not. Yeah, I saw that first byte data. How do you reduce the first byte time? Uh, by a better server. <laughs> I mean, you can so you can either set up a CDN that is that the note place servers all around the world to sort of make your server geographically closer to your end users. Um, a lot of times you'll have um, your server side processing scripts, like your database calls, your whatever you're doing behind the scenes on the server uh, are taking a lot of time. And it's, uh, on a lot of sites you'll see um, like, like 500 milliseconds spent before an, even a byte is sent back to the server, just like doing database stuff. Um, so one thing you can do is to do more client-side caching. Um, that's just kind of like a, putting a band-aid on the problem. Not really solving it. So um, you can either buy a faster server, improve your server side code, uh, get a CDN to, to uh, send the, the bytes down faster just because they're closer to the user. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it looks like a lot of, I mean, I'd say a good chunk of what you're doing to speed up performance is using JavaScript to load asynchronously. Do you have to do stuff like with no scripts and fallback or uh, no script tags and fallbacks or in the event that someone has it turned off or and does that run you does that run you up against like section five hundred eight compliance issues or so I do a lot of government I do work for a government contractor and the spec's about twelve years old and has never actually been updated and everybody's well you can't use JavaScript well you can but and, yeah so so we use uh, as I kind of mentioned. We use something called progress for enhancement. So when I say that Film Group tries to make the web work for everyone, that means like literally everyone. So even our no JavaScript experience, we still want to be functional to the end user. So yes, we have JavaScript like loaders that will load optimizations to the page, but all of our markup um, that we serve to the end user should work independently. Um, so we have exceptions to that rule, like we have like fancy icons that we'll add. So we use a tool called Grunticon to sort of load our superfluous icons that we might use um, on our page, and we do use a NoScript to, to show those um, if the bootloader um, doesn't work or it errors out. Um, but for the most part, our page should be usable in some form. It won't look pretty for sure. But it will be usable in some form um, if JavaScript isn't uh, working or hasn't loaded yet. And another thing I would say about that is that um, when you're dealing with JavaScript required discussions, it isn't necessarily that, and there's a great tweet by Jake Archibald, but I don't have it in the slideshow, that everyone is a user that doesn't have JavaScript until the JavaScript has successfully loaded. So when the page first renders, there's a certain time in between the first render happens and the JavaScript loads or completes successfully. So in that amount of time, every user that visits your page is a no JavaScript user. <clears throat> so if the if the external requests time out for that JavaScript <coughs> that you want to load onto your page, um, then you have a no JavaScript user. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So just something to think about. What's your strategy for testing all of this? 
seems like there's just a what really testing was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so CSS regression testing is a real big problem that we have, um, and we're trying to do something more automated around taking screenshots um, using a build tool that will go out and take different screenshots at different resolutions to make sure that we haven't had regressions in our CSS. Um, we do, so every employee at Filmo Group has their own sort of device testing lab, so I have like, I think like 10 different mobile devices that sit on my desk that I can go out and like test our website on an actual device. And then we also use something called Browser Stack, uh, which gives you sort of online virtual machines so you don't have to manage those locally on your, uh, on your device or on your machine, which is, virtual machines are kind of a pain in the ass to maintain. So um, yeah, I would recommend checking out Browser Stack if you can get your employer to buy you a bunch of devices. <laughs> <laughs> so, does that answer your question? <clears throat> Is there a way to, I mean, do most of these, like Google AdSense and things like that, do they allow you to asynchronously or defer load? Um, what do you mean allow? Well, I mean, <laughs> without <laughs> SEO penalties? Or um, is there usually any ramifications for that? No, I mean, I, th I, th I believe that Google, Ad I'm not the Google AdSense guy at Film Group, but I believe that Google AdSense has an asynchronous um, API that you can use to inject onto your page. I don't think a lot of advertising providers do. Um, but I think that Google AdSense does. Now, getting it to work in a way that's responsive is a little bit more difficult because when your viewports change, your ad box might change. Um, so one thing that we've had to do in our pages is that we have ad resizing and learn have to actually reinitialize the ads, which is great for revenue, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the ad blocks change in your layout, so sometimes you gotta resize new ads. Not great for performance. Answer your question. Yeah. Anybody got stump for last one? Anybody got an easy one? We're all ready to get out of here. All right. Thanks. Man.